another pleasant late afternoon you may hear the occasional bird but uh, it's not that pleasant in terms of both the public and private health system in this country currently because ultimately they are intertwined and we forgot the lessons of 50 years ago when the Whitlam Labor government introduced Medibank plus community health centres. Now currently we can look at the health crisis in terms of a lack of resources. We can look at it in terms of an ageing population with uh, chronic disabilities who are living much longer because of uh, the pharmaceutical benefits scheme and the medications which are available through that pharmaceutical benefits scheme. We can look at it through the prism of uh, COVID-19 pandemic, which continues, although vaccination, antivirals, and uh, the fact that it's almost uh, become endemic in this country anyway, um, has decreased its virulence to a significant degree, but it's still quite dangerous, especially for those not vaccinated. Or we can look at it in terms of structure. Historically in Australia, we've had two public health systems. We've had a, a public hospital system and a private system which covers both private hospitals and medical practices, both general practice and specialist medical practices. The key to the private sector is a fee-for-service model. Now, as far as private hospital care is concerned, you can actually insure yourself for a quite a significant sum. Although the federal government continues to provide a assistance for those who buy private health insurance, about 40%, that's about $6 billion, of the private health insurance you pay for private health insurance is actually a subsidy from the taxpayer through the federal government. Then you've got the fee-for-service system in specialist practices and general practices. So in 1972 when the Whitlam led Labor government was elected it had an interesting health policy. It had a health policy which is radically different from today's health policies. Because believe it or not, before 1973 when Medibank was introduced, many people across the country apart from Queensland were paying for public hospital care. It was based on a um, sliding scale depending on what you earned. So the introduction of Medibank, which is now called Medicare, that's a universal health insurance scheme, did two things. It continued the fee-for-service model, which has been around since colonisation began. You've got the resources, you can buy the best health care money you can buy. You don't have the resources, you have to rely on an understaffed, under-resourced, under-financed public health sector. Obviously, if it's an emergency situation, the public health sector is one of the most important aspects of care, both private and public. Anybody for serious injury, or 99.9% .9 of people with serious injuries and serious catastrophic medical conditions end up in the public health system because the private health sector can't make any money out of them. So let's go back to 1973. Now, Medibank was a universal health insurance scheme which meant that if an Australian who was entitled to a Medibank card and now a Medicare card went to a private clinic they would be either fully or partially subsidised for that visit but that wasn't the only health initiative which was introduced in 1973. But there was a much more important health initiative which was introduced in 1973 which was designed to introduce a salaried 
public system which cover both general practice and specialists through community health centres. Now because of pushing and shoving from a population which had a much more radical affinity than they do in 2022, the Labor government was forced to introduce a second tier in 1973 and that was the community health sector. And the community health sector was introduced initially to take up the gaps which were, which were in the country as far as access to primary health care in Australia in 1973. And it was a little bit like the community radio sector. What happened is the communities that felt they didn't have a lack of private resources, had a lack of private resources, held public meetings, set up a committee and then applied to the federal government for funding to set up a fully salaried community health sector. And that's the key word. It was a salaried community health sector. It was not a fee-for-service model. Now obviously the AMA and the other medical organisations were screaming blue murder because they understood that the introduction of a widespread community health care sector which was salaried and financed by the federal government would be act as competition and force clinics to bulk bill. Now this is the central element of the health reforms. So what happened to the community health sector? Well the community health sector has basically been destroyed. It's been destroyed by successive Liberal National Parties and Labor Parties which have handed over the control of those few community health centres which were formed initially over to the state government. The idea of local communities running these community health centres and appointing salaried staff as a result of grants from the federal government on a triennial basis went out the window. And what we saw is the private sector move into the community health care sector. If you look at community health services around this country today, there's only one or two in the whole of Australia which have a salaried system. Most of the other community health centres that are left, and not many very left, have relied on a fee-for-service model bulk billing in order to pay their medical practitioners or providing a mechanism by which private doctors sort of can actually use those facilities on a fee-for-service basis. So what's this all about? Well what's happened in the last 40 years is that Medibank and Medicare has been scuttled. It's been scuttled by governments both Labor Party governments and Liberal National Party governments and it's been scuttled in terms of the rebate which is paid to private fee-for-service doctors. And what's happened 50 years after the introduction of Medibank and now Medicare, 40 years after the introduction of Medicare, what we see today is a return for bulk billing doctors which doesn't even cover costs in a majority of clinics. Now initially this problem was resolved by the formation of by corporations moving into the general practice sector into primary health care buying up clinics and actually paying doctors believe it or not a percentage or of who they are on a fee-for-service basis. But the dilemma is that as less and less money went to the Medicare rebate, because there is no community health care sector worth talking about in this country, is there has fees are introduced 
by primary health carers and obviously fees introduced by uh, been uh, been uh, levied by many specialists and these fees can be two or three times what you actually uh, get as a rebate from the federal government what's actually happened is that not able to access primary health care through a bulk billing doctor people are now flocking to accident and emergency departments because accidents and emergency departments around the country continue to have access for everyone. The dilemma is that these accident and emergency departments are flooded by cases which don't actually need the skills and investigative tools that accident and emergency departments in public hospitals have. 70% of visits to accident and emergency departments could be resolved by access to primary health care providers. But because of the structure of the primary health care system in this country, a fee-for-service model, and the reduction of the Medicare rebate, what we are seeing is people being forced in accident emergency. So we get the ridiculous situation that real emergencies sometimes are missed by overworked tri tri triage staff and people die because accident emergency departments are flooded with cases which could be dealt with at a primary health care level. But because the fee-for-service model relies on a Medicare rebate and because many primary health care centres and general practices are now no longer bulk billing and those that bulk bill need a quite a rapid throughput five to ten minute consultations in order for that clinic to survive. So what we are seeing is that people with chronic health issues and one third of Australians have chronic health issues. So what we are seeing there's a lot of minor presentations to accident emergency departments which stop them doing the work they're actually designed to do. Now, we've noticed that the Grattan Institute and many other people have been raising these issues for over two decades now, and no government has really taken much interest. They're beginning to take interest because more and more clinics are refusing to bulk bill and charging fees, sometimes three times what the rebate is, because the rebate is not kept up with inflation, let, over, let alone the increased costs to run a medical practice. So let's get back to our original proposition of community health centres. If we had salaried, and the key word is salaried, community health centres around the country for the last 50 years, we had been funding government-owned community health centres with salaried staff, we would not find ourselves in this position where there are no options for people. So to me, the great reforms that were introduced by the Whitlam Leader Labor government because of pressure from Australians to sort out the healthcare system to give everybody access to health care, making access to health care a right, not a privilege. That could only occur when you've got competition for the private health care sector. And that competition comes from government funded community health services, which have doctors as well as psychologists and occupational therapists and dieticians and nurses and the list goes on and on. Salaried systems with no pressure, no throughput pressure, what would occur is that many people with chronic health problems would actually access community health centres and that would relieve a lot of pressure from the private health sector as well as the public hospital system, and that's the key, the public hospital system. 
So the destruction of the nascent community healthcare sector after the dismissal of the Whitlam led Labor government in 75 by the Governor General led to the destruction of this second tier necessary for the health reforms to come in which gave which made access to health care a right not a privilege. So 50, 50 years later we are now reaping what we have sown. We are reaping the destruction of the public health system and even the private health system by a system which has been chronically overfunded. Now if we had community health centres, so the population is say 25 million, let's say we have one community health centre for every 10,000 people, that's 10 health centres for 100,000, 100 for a million, two and a half thousand salaried community health centres around the country. The amount of money which would would be needed to be invested in in the rebate, the healthcare rebates, would actually decrease. The pressure on accident emergency departments would decrease. The type of services people with chronic disabilities could access would increase. Because what we would see is individuals attaching themselves to specific community health centres in their regions. Now we are wasting billions of dollars. Billions of dollars continue to, to, to support both a underfunded, under-resourced public health system, which is not fit for purposes, and a private fee-for-service health system, which again is not fit for purpose in 2022. The nature of illness has changed. The chronic nature of illness has changed. The increasing ageing of the population has put increasing pressure. The climate emergency, increasing temperatures, pandemics are also putting pressure. Increased natural disasters, they're all putting pressure. So, so what's the solution? The solution is to have publicly funded, salaried community health centres. And how do you fund this? You fund this by ensuring that 1% that owns the means of reduction, distribution, exchange and communication actually pay taxation. But unfortunately, because of the parliamentary snowflakes who are begging and beseech the corporate sector, you know, to uh, throw a few crumbs their way. I don't believe we will see any changes to the chronic underfunding of the public health system or any push to create community health centres. Now, community health centres are very different to the super clinics which have been formed. They're subsidised fee-for-service clinics, which the Commonwealth Government said they would create. So it's interesting that 50 years later, an initiative which would have been able to deal with this country's health issues was killed, was aborted at stillbirth. And 50 years later, we continue to have the same debate about the same issue, putting forward the same non-solutions to address the healthcare crisis we currently have. Now I've been quite, I've been involved in the community health sector in the very early stages in the 70s and it was an ideological push. But that ideological push to have salaried staff was defeated by the private health sector. And the fact is that unless we change the way the health care is delivered, it doesn't matter how much money you give to the private health care industry, how much taxpayers' money is used to subsidise private health insurance, how many people are forced to take out private health insurance, it doesn't matter. The same problems will continue to bedevil us individually, 
as families, as communities, and as a nation. So if you're interested in pursuing these ideas, I encourage you to join public interest before corporate interest. You can access, do it online, go to pipsy.net, P-I-B-C-I.net, P-I-B-C-I.net. Next week, who knows what we'll be talking about.